Welcome to the Fall 2020 A to J Author New Author Training Series. I'm Jessica Frank, A to J Author's Project Manager for Cali, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. This is video two in a five part video series. In this video, we are going to provide you with an overview of the A to J Author software and talk about the basics of question design. You create A to J guided interviews on our website, www.a2jauthor.org. To log in, go to the Author tab. If you're logged in, you'll see the Run A to J Author button. If not, you won't see that button and you'll need to scroll to the bottom to the login link. Click that and you'll be taken to the page where you can either log in or create an account if you don't already have one. Once you're logged in, you'll be taken to the Interviews tab. This is where you'll start all A to J guided interviews. It shows you all of the interviews you've already worked on, allows you to upload existing A to J guided interviews to work on, or create blank interviews. Most of what you'll do through A to J Author is move through the navigation tabs. The navigation tabs show you all of the different components of the authoring software that you can access. We'll talk about each one of these individually, focusing most heavily on the Pages tab because that's where you'll spend the majority of your time. The first tab is the About tab. It contains the general information and metadata about the interview. Things like the title, the description, the jurisdiction, who the author is, what version you're running, any revision history, what language the interview is, and any history of who's worked on it before. It also allows you to upload any graphics, including branding logos and end graphics. It allows you to include feedback options, which allow end users to provide feedback to you, to whatever email address is specified, and to our team so that we can address any technical issues that arise. It allows you to select the guide avatar, either a male or female avatar, with five different skin tones and eight hair color options. And it allows you to pick from 16 different languages. After the About tab is the Variables tab. This tab lists all of the variables by name. Double clicking on the variable name will pull up the variable information window, which will allow you to edit the name and type of the variable. In this list, you can also see if variables have been set as repeats, and you can see what type of variable they are. You can add new variables, create them from scratch, or add them from a hot docs component file. After the variables tab is the steps tab. Steps in an interview act as the main outline for the guided interview. Steps give the end user the feeling of progressing through a guided interview. On this tab, you can add and delete steps for a maximum of 12 steps in your interview. Each step can have an unlimited number of questions and the steps signs can be edited to show whatever name you'd like. This is an example of the sign posts along the way in preview mode. They show the end user how much further they have to go to get to the courthouse and give them context about the questions that they're currently uh, answering. The fourth tab down is the pages tab. This is where you'll likely spend a majority of your time creating your A to J guided interview. The pages or questions are arranged in alphanumeric order by step in the list. The list also provides you with icon hints about what's in each page via learn mores, logic, or types of fields. You can create new pages and pop-ups here and delete existing ones. Clicking on the name of the page will pop up the question design editor where you'll be able to edit the text of the page, but we'll talk more about that later. Next comes the map tab. It got a facelift and feature enhancement in the summer of 2020. The map lets you see the forest for the trees within your interview. It gives you the larger picture of how your pages fit together in a graphical representation. Part of this summer's enhancement has been to add to the capabilities of the map tab. Now you can create new pages and drag the connecting lines around to connect them to other pages. You can add buttons to a page by creating a new destination line, and you can delete existing connecting lines as well. There's the ability to zoom in or out for a better view of your entire map, an A to J author can auto clean up the map flowchart and organize all of your existing pages by step and alphanumeric order. After the map tab comes the files tab. 
The Files tab shows you all of the files that are in your interview. This includes ones that you have added, like XML lists, MP3s, MP4s, and JPEGs. It also includes the files that are intrinsic to the interview, like the guide.json file, which is used by the A to J viewer, and the guide.xml file, which is used when authoring. Anything you add, you can delete here. Anything that's intrinsic to the interview can't be deleted. The All Logic tab shows you all the logic that you have in your interview. It also allows you to edit any of the logic fields from one place instead of having to jump around to the various pages to make changes. Similar to the All Logic tab, the All Text tab lets you see all the text in your interview and edit it in one place. A helpful feature here is your browser's Find and Replace search option. You can search for and replace a word if you've misspelled it or need to make a change. The Preview tab lets you see the A to J guided interview as your end user would see it. You use this for testing. Preview mode also has the debug panel, which allows you to see the variables in your interview, and it lets you see all of the script or logic that's happening behind the scenes. You have the ability at the bottom to also edit this question, which takes you to the question design window for the current question you're on, or resume edit, which takes you back to where you enter the preview mode from. Next down comes the Report tab. The Report tab lets you have three options for reports with an A to J author. This first one is an example of a full report. It shows you all of the text, variables, question, logic, everything that's in your A to J guided interview. This is an example of a text report. It shows what would need to be translated. It's only the text of the questions and the learn mores and all the labels. Finally, this, this is an example of a citation report. Citation reports show you all the places you or previous authors have added in citations or notes. As a new author, we highly recommend adding in citations wherever you can. These give you and future authors hints or reasons for why logic was crafted a specific way. For example, why, why you used a comparison to say $35,000 for income instead of some other number. Maybe it was your organization's income limit when you created the interview question. Mark that all down for future authors to know. We provided citation fields for question text, learn more sections, the question as a whole, and logic sections. So wherever you see a citation field, please add in a citation if possible. The Publish tab lets you link the interview from a to jauthor.org to wherever you're going to host it. If you're self-hosting or wanting to share your interview with another developer, you'll download the zip file. Note, leave the file zipped. You can upload a zipped file directly into your A to J author account on the interviews tab. Our system isn't going to accept re-zipped files for upload, so make sure to keep that file zipped. If you're going to be publishing to a to j.org, which is Cali's free hosting site for forms for self-represented litigants, you can do so from this tab. You can also upload to our partner Law Help Interactive's two sites, both their testing site, Rebuild QA, or their production site. You do need to have a separate Law Help Interactive login to do any publishing there. The a to j.org tab shows you all of the interviews you have published to Cali's a to j.org hosting site. It gives you control over them, including the ability to add their metadata or edit it, make them live or keep them in demo mode with a watermark, or delete them as well. The Templates tab will be covered in video 5 of this series, but this is where you create your backend A to J DAT or A to J Author Document Assembly Tool template. The A to J Analytics tab is also new in the fall of 2020. This tab allows you to see analytics for your interviews that are running on a hosted site, be they LHI hosted interviews, A to J.org -host, hosted, or self hosted. This doesn't apply to interviews that are still in development on our production site, a to jauthor.org. It's only for live hosted interviews. To see your analytics report, fill out the request report. Once your custom segment is created, it'll appear within this interview's analytics tab. Each interview that's live has a custom segment in our a to j analytics tool, and the report is generated within that interview's analytics tab. 
Now that I've given you an overview of the authoring software, let's talk about the question design process and where you'll do the bulk of your work in an interview, the question design editor. Interviews are generally created in the Pages tab. Now the new map features I talked about earlier allow you to replicate most of this behavior that I'll talk about, so you as the author can choose where you prefer to work. On the Pages tab and the list of pages on the Map tab, the questions are arranged in alphanumeric order by step. How the questions are connected to each other and how the end user will progress through an interview is controlled not by the order shown here, but by the destinations of each of the page's buttons. So you could have a different order showing here than your end user would encounter. This is the question design window. You'll become very familiar with this screen. This is where you'll script your questions, create fields, edit buttons, and script advanced logic statements. For the question design editor, it's all about the scroll. All the work of authoring happens in just one screen. To access the features, scroll through the question design editor. Starting at the top, we have the step number assigned to this page. This is where you can move a page from one step to another. Then there's the name of the page. The notes section is for the author's eyes only. It won't be seen by the end user, but it will be included in the citation report and the full report. Under that is the question text section. This is where you type the text of your question. Then there's the text citation field and the text audio. You can upload MP3 files to your question that can read the question text. This is less helpful now because A to J Author underwent an accessibility audit in 2018 and is WCAG 2.0 compliant through level AAA. Users who require a screen reader can now more easily use an A to J guided interview with their preferred reader instead of authors needing to add audio clips manually. Under this is the Learn More section. The Learn More prompt is the question the end user avatar has that prompts the response from the guide avatar. Learn Mores are just-in-time learning features that allow you to give your end user additional information at the point in which they need it. In a Learn More, it is displayed in a question and answer format. The end user avatar thinks the prompt and the user clicks Learn More to see the response or get the help. The help style, which is the reply the guide avatar gives, can be text, audio, a graphic, or a video, or all of them. By default, the help is text, but you can have more than one option. The help field is the text reply for the learn more from the guide avatar. There's also a help citation field and help audio if you want to upload audio to the learn more. Scrolling further down shows you the media label field for marking media as supplementary per WCAG guidelines. WCAG is Web Content Accessibility. You can also add in audio, graphic, or video clips and include a graphic alternative text for images and transcripts for uploaded videos. With any multimedia additions, you should strive to make them as accessible as possible. You can learn more about ways to make your interviews compliant with WCAG version 2.0 in our authoring guide under the accessibility section of chapter seven. Before we, we scroll further down the question design editor, here are the text editing options for your question text. You can embolden, italicize, or underline. You can add a block quote, indent, outdent, add bullets, and numbered lists. You can create hyperlinks and unlink them as well. Finally, you can associate a pop-up with a word or phrase in your question text. Remember, pop-ups are used to provide just-in-time definitions for legal terms or other difficult words. If we keep scrolling down in the question text section, we get to the counting variable field and the checkbox for nested repeat loops. The counting variable field is used for repeat loops and the nested loop checkbox is only used when you want to do nested repeat loops. Nested repeat loops are one of the most complicated things you can do in A to J Author and they won't be covered in this video training series. If you're interested in them, there is a training video on nested repeat loops on our YouTube channel and a sample exercise to practice them under the Learn tab on our website, adajauthor.org. The next section after the question text is the field section. Fields are ways to collect information from your end user. You can have up to nine fields per question and each one can be a different field type or it can be the same. We'll talk about field types in a bit. Here in this screenshot is a basic overview of a field. There's a type, a label, that's what it displays to the end user before the field, like name or date of birth. Every field needs to have a variable associated with it. 
A to J author has to have some place to put the user's answer to that field. If you don't add a variable, A to J author will create a default blank one, which will cause documents not to assemble in hot docs. So make sure every field has its own variable. Under the variable field is the default value. This will display to the end user as a pre-selected option, but they can change it if they want. For example, if you want to pre-select the state for the user's address, you can do that here. You can make a field required in that the user must answer it before they move on, or not with the required checkbox shown here. For text variables, you can enter a maximum character count, you can change the default error message, and you can add a sample value. The sample value is just used for testing purposes. You add it here to the field, then click the Fill button in preview mode to pre-fill in that sample value as you test. Here's some additional information about fields. Each field type has different limitations you can impose on it. So we had maximum characters for text field types, but here you can see date ranges can be limited by a minimum and a maximum, along with number field types as well. You can attach external lists, which are XML files, to create a drop-down list for your end user to choose from, a common one is the US states one shown in this screenshot. We created that XML list for you to download. It's available under the new user resources under the learn tab on our website, adajauthor.org. It has the states listed by full name for the end user in alphabetical order, but the postal code is what is saved in the answer file. You can also create internal lists by typing in the first item, then adding a hard return, that's the enter key on most keyboards, between each subsequent item. There are 14 field types available for you to choose from. They are pretty straightforward and easy to decide which one is most appropriate for your question. Some have shadow prompts so the end user enters the data the correct way. For example, phone number or social security number. Some have data restrictions built in, like the date field requires that the user type in the American style dates only. That's month, month, day, day, year, 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 year or pick from the calendar provided. There's additional information about each field type in our authoring guide found on the website under the Learn tab. Next, we have the button section. Buttons are how you move an end user from one question to the next. The button has a label. That's what the user sees on the button itself. The button can have a variable, but doesn't have to, and it can assign that variable a value if the user clicks it. The destination is the next page if the user hits that button. Different buttons can have different destinations. Then there are the repeat loop options that we'll cover in a subsequent video. Buttons by default, there's only one button on a default question, the continue button. You can have up to three buttons and each one can have different options for the end user to pick from. You can label them however you'd like. So they don't have to be just yes or no. It can be something like petitioner or respondent. So you can use a button instead of a field when you have three or fewer options for your end user to choose from. Here's what a button can do. It can assign a value to a variable, it can take the user to another question, and it can set or increment a counting variable. When you select the destination question, a drop-down list will appear of other questions you've made, back to prior question, success process form, some of the exiting functions, or the ability to exit an end user to a website, or the assemble commands if you're using the A to J DAT document assembly tool. This is an example of the pick a destination page that you'd see when you hit select destination. The final section in the question design editor is the advanced logic section. We'll cover more of this in a following video, but here's a quick overview. You can script if else statements that will run either before the user sees the question or after the user presses one of the buttons on the page. There's also the logic citation section. Remember to use that to leave breadcrumb notes for the next developer, whether it's future you or someone else. Tell them why you scripted the logic the way you did. So if the example of the logic is if income NU equals 25,000, do X. Explain why you use 25,000. Was it 125% of the poverty guidelines in 2020? Was it based on an internal memo from your organization setting income limits? Whatever it is, make it easy to check later for, that those values are still valid for the next person who has to work on this interview. There are five commands that you'll need to know if you want to script logic in A to J author. But remember, not all interviews need logic. 
you can have a complete interview that uses fields and branches via buttons and has no logic in it at all. The five commands are if, else, go to, set, and end if. All if statements must have an end if, and each one of these logic commands must be on its own line. You cannot have if and go to on the same line or if and end if on the same line. They have to have hard returns in between each one. Now let's talk about the overall design of questions. The tips on the next couple of screens have come from my experience as authoring actual A to J guided interviews and from talking with our experienced authors. So overall, keep your audience and your goal in mind. Make sure to include instructions on how to complete the forms. Let the user know if they're going to need additional information before they get started in the interview. Are they going to need their, their spouse's W-2? Are they going to need the address of their children's school? Anything that they wouldn't necessarily know offhand, let them know ahead of time what they're going to need to complete the form. You as the author control the flow of the questions, so group questions together. If the form itself has the questions about the spouse on pages one and seven, that doesn't mean you have to ask them in the order in which they're listed on the form. Ask like questions with like. So ask about their spouse, all of the spouse questions together. Ask all of the children questions together. So this helps keep the end user in the right frame of mind and to give context to what you're talking about. Speaking of giving context, make sure you give context to each set of questions that allows your end user tra to transition smoothly from one topic to the next. So make sure you use uh, those transition words that you learned in law school, like subsequently or next, we finished talking about this subject, now I'm gonna take you on and talk to you about this. I've asked you questions about your spouse, now I'm going to ask you a series of questions about your children, etc. Help them move through the questions just like a good story would have uh, transitions and context, a good interview should as well. Make sure to begin with easy and safe questions. The first question shouldn't be what their social security number is. Um, that is unnerving for people who are using a computer or aren't familiar with the interview interface itself. So make sure to start out um, slowly and easily to build their confidence in the tool. The goal that we always recommend is a fifth grade reading level. Make sure to use bold, but use it sparingly. So think of one word or one item per question. You want to emphasize without yelling in internet speak. You can use the different question formats. We do have 14 different field types, plus the buttons, plus long and short question text. So you want to um, use those, but balance consistency as well. So make it interesting, but you don't have to use all of the options available in A to J in every interview. And if possible, always use images in the learn more section because a picture is worth a thousand words. For the overall flow of your interview, at the beginning of the interview, you should have that checklist of things the user is going to need, instructions on how to use the interview, any qualification or eligibility questions that would kick someone out of an interview. You don't want them to spend 30 minutes or an hour filling out a form to, turn, to have it turn out that they're not in the right county or they don't um, meet the qualifications. Anything that would make someone not be able to use the form, kick them out as soon as possible. And then there's the hook. The why is the end user doing this? At the end of this process, you're going to have all the documents you need to do X, or you're going to have all the paperwork you need to start the process of Y. Give them the hook, the incentive to why they should continue. With techniques, start off with neutral questions and get harder. And it's always an opportunity for advocacy. So for example, just because the paper form requires a social security number, if you know that most of your end users are likely going to be on a court kiosk or a library computer where they might not know how to clear the cache or um, close the browser properly, you can use your automated form as an opportunity for advocacy to explain to them that they should hand write in the social security number because it's required by the court, but you don't have to ask for it in the automated form. There are some things that you can leave blank and explain how to complete after. For each individual question, you should evoke the truth, allow um, all possible answers, allow for an I don't know or an other, but don't make it ambiguous. So you want to allow for someone who you might think this is a very easy answer. That doesn't mean that somebody who's in a stressful situation has um, English potentially as a second language, has maybe a fifth grade reading level, is trying to do this on their lunch break at a court kiosk. They may be overwhelmed. 
um, allow them to that room to answer the questions in the way that is easiest for them. Be careful about assuming what a user knows. If a question has to rely on a previous question, um, you should try not to have it rely on a previous question as much as possible. But if it has to, you can use a macro, which you can learn about more in the next training video. A macro will allow you to call up information that an end user has already given you and relay it to the end user. So you can tell them things that they've already told you to remind them if you have to ask follow-up questions about that. And be careful with leaving language. With plain language and readability, you should always consider the age, education, culture, and language of your reader. When I'm developing guided interviews or I'm teaching this to law students, I talk about creating a user persona or, or a couple user personas. Think about who your common user would be, what situation they'd be in, what their experience would be before coming to the form, and then write that interview for them. Use familiar terms and phrases, and if you have to use a specialized word or legal jargon, define it. That's what pop-ups are for and what learn mores are for. Get, if you have to know if they're the petitioner or the respondent, because that's legally relevant, give them the definition of what that word means. Use the active voice and direct address. Try to eliminate surplus words and boil it down for your end user. Again, there's that fifth grade reading level that we're shooting for. Under the report tab, the full report will show you what your Flesh Kincaid grade level is for each one of your questions. And if you want to learn more about plain language, writeclearly.org has a plain language online course, which you can see here the URL that you can go to and test out your skills using A to J Author's sister software, Cali Author. Finally, some tips and tricks for authoring. When you start off, I find it's always helpful to start with a script or an outline. Make sure you have the scope of your form or your automated uh, document assembly project narrowed down. So you want to make sure that you have all the forms that your user is going to need to complete X. So do they need a cover sheet? Do they need um, a sample motion? Do they need notice? Do they need the form itself? Like, What are all the things they're going to need to complete the process? Once you have those in place, go through and highlight all the variables, all the questions you're going to have to ask them, and build a script or at least an outline before you get into the software really helps to keep you organized. It makes it easier when you're authoring because it's easier to edit a script or an outline than to go in and edit an interview after, after you've already started working in it and moving things around. Um, if you are doing translations, the text report under the um, reports tab is really helpful for pulling out what exactly needs to be translated and what can be left in English for developers only. And if you're sharing for editing or peer review with a subject matter expert, they may not be familiar with the software, you can run a full report that will give them a printout, you can generate a PDF document or print it for them, and it will have everything in the interview so they can just read through it. You can always also host on a to j.org for testing purposes and send somebody a link to test as well. If you have any questions or you need additional help while you're learning A to J Author, you can always reach out to me, jessica at kelly.org. Follow our Twitter account at A to J Author for news about, um, about the software itself, about document assembly news, about upcoming opportunities or trainings or code pushes that we're doing. If you want to practice some of the skills that you've learned today, you can check out our sample exercises. They're at that URL there on our website, or you can hover over the Learn tab and drill down to Sample Exercises. We currently have 12 sample exercises to practice all things A to J author. And if you're interested in any of drilling down more into any of the things we've talked about today, you can go to our A to J authoring guide, which is our software manual, which is under the Learn tab as well on our website. And you can check out everything there is to know about A to J author. Thank you.